Order. The call to order. Okay. Okay. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will now ask our recording secretary to conduct roll call. Here. Committee member Johnson? Yes. Committee member Levin? Landaverde. Landaverde? Here. <laughs> Committee member Leo? Here. Committee member Lugo? Here. Committee member Martinez? We have a quorum. The next item is public comments for items on the agenda. Do we have any? Speakers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, speakers. I would like to speak. Oh, okay. Uh, is uh, this is prior to? Uh, I'm sorry. This, this is for items on the agenda. Um, I actually. Is this the only point to speak, or to speak? Um, at the end of the meeting, the public will be provided an opportunity to speak on any item that okay, is not I'll, on the agenda. I'll do the public speaking. Okay. After. After the end. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is excused absences. <coughs> okay, and we did, um, we did uh, receive communication from uh, Member Martinez that she intended to join us by phone but may not be available. So um, at this point, unless she joins the meeting later, we will uh, reflect in the minutes that she's in excused absence. Okay. And um, at this point, before we go on to the next item, our city manager would like to uh, welcome you to the city. So thank you all for being here and taking the time out of your valuable um, schedules to do this. Um, it's so great when you have volunteers in the community that will step up and donate their time. It's a very important role that you guys are undertaking here. Our Measure X tax dollars are crucial to our city and your oversight and advice and recommendations. I really look forward to um, working with you and hearing your insights on that. And you got a lot of work cut out for you. Now, ideally, this committee would have been formed formed in March, um, which would have provided you some time to provide input into the 1920 uh, budget. However, it didn't get formed until now, and the budget has already been built for 1920. Um, but still, you have the opportunity to provide us insight on how we are programming those dollars. Um, we do have the ability to change some of the programming to a certain extent, not really you know, switching the dollars out where we allocated them. But as you know, Measure X is for a few years. So so um, certainly you'll be able to have a greater role in the future years and where we program those dollars. And I'm going to leave you in the very capable hands of our finance director, Catherine, who has a full agenda for you tonight. But once again, I want to welcome you to the city and thank you for stepping up and doing this. So enjoy. Uh, the next item on the agenda is committee member introductions. Before electing a chair and vice chair, let's take a few minutes to introduce ourselves to the committee, the public, and staff. My name is uh, Keith Carpenter. Um, no one else want to know about me? <laughs> uh, I've worked for uh, Southern California Edison for 32 years, have an extensive background in construction. I understand the bureaucratic processes and getting things done, having come from a large corporation. Um, I've been with the, in the city of Santa Ana for 34 years. And um, yeah, I just want to get involved and see things get better. All right, I'll go next. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm a, a resident here in Santa Ana for boy, about 14 years now, 15 years. My oldest son is 13, so that's how I kind of measure that <laughs> length to stay here. Um, I'm a CPA, uh, uh, a, a partner in, a, 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 uh, in about a 50-person firm, uh, three offices, uh, uh, one in Orange County, one in LA County, one in Dallas, Texas. Um, I work uh, uh, quite a bit with, uh, with both 
at the corporate level, individual level, and multiple different types of, uh, of taxes, and married three kids and uh, live in West Floral Park. So that's me. Hi, my name is Abigail Landaverde. Um, I'm currently working for WNC as a financial analyst. I work um, in the disposition team. So we work with Litech, um, with affordable housing, if you guys know anything about that. Um, I've lived in Santa Ana for 28 years. Um, Santa Ana is everything I know. <laughs> so I'm kind of glad that I'm able to be here and be a part of it, just because I've never been involved in the city. So I'm glad that I'm able to have this opportunity and see where these tax dollars go that we voted on. So thank you. <laughs> I'm Chris Leo. I'm, I've been a resident of uh, Santa Ana for 24 years. I spent 10 years on the Planning Commission, four years as chair of the Planning Commission. Um, I've done government relations for St. Joe's, St. Joseph Hogue, Providence St. Joe's Hogue. Now I'm at UCI. I deal a lot with government finance and, and um, uh, intergovernmental transfers and uh, plenty of public finance. So um, I'm happy to be here and serve again. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alonzo Lugo. Uh, resident of Santa Ana for 44 years. Um, I'm a homeowner. I've only owned my home, though, for about 11. Um, Marine Corps veteran. I've had an opportunity to, to be in the wireless and development, land use development business for the last 20 years. I currently work for AT&T doing the same thing. Um, and like other members here, I'm just happy to be here and want to volunteer and give my time and hopefully influence uh, the dollars going towards the right agenda. Thanks. So um, would our temporary chair like us to uh, staff to introduce ourselves? Please. Thank you. Um, so I'm Catherine Downs. I'm the, uh, I have a very long title, but in essence, I'm the finance director of the city. And I've been here since October, but uh, this isn't my first rodeo. I've been in government for quite a while. I was at, previously at City of Carson for several years, and before that, City of Rancho Palos Verdes for 15 years. Um, so I am very much in love with being a public servant. I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to um, help Santa Ana make any progress that it can. Oh, and, and I'm a CPA as well. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Sergio Vidal, assistant director here with the city finance department. Been with the city's finance department in this capacity for four and a half years now. Um, private work experience also in other municipalities, City of Garden Grove and Cerritos, and some uh, state government experience along with the federal government with the IRS. Um, very excited to be here today. Obviously, this is a, a really a unique time for the city, having this new revenue source and going into the to the projects and having this committee just conduct the oversight of this is really a key component. And it was one of the reasons why I think um, this measure was passed because there is there be some level of oversight over these funds over the next time, 10, 15, 20 years. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kristen Andrade. I'm the recording secretary for the committee. Um, I've been with the city since March, 90 days. <laughs> um, prior to that, I was uh, I worked for a nonprofit hospital, and I was born and raised in this city. So, thank you. Uh, the next item is election of a chairperson and vice chairperson. Would anyone like to nominate a member for chair? I'll nominate myself. <laughs> I, I would like to nominate Mr. Leo. I'm not serve in any capacity, so. Okay. So we have two nominations. Um, would you like to call for a motion? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? The motion would be to vote, is that correct? No, the motion would be to, because um, you nominated yourself and we have another nomination, and so if somebody would like to make a motion to um, that somebody be elected chair, somebody would move and then somebody would second and then you would vote on that. If it fails, then you can try again. Uh, I would like to make a motion to nominate Mr. Leo as the chairperson. Okay. All motion, Mr. Carp Carpenter? Okay, so we have a motion. Um, we're following Robert's rules of orders, um, which is okay. We're, we're gonna stumble over this, this is fine. Um, but with a the motion, then if we do not get a second on the motion, 
then we can make another motion. So would anybody like to uh, second Member Johnson's motion? No? Okay. And so with no second, then you can make your motion, and then we'll see if you get a second. Um, I motion Mr. Carpenter. Okay. Would anybody like to second that? I'll second it. Okay. And now that you have a motion and a second, you can call for the vote. Okay, I'd like to call for a vote for election of chair. And because we are not currently using the phone, um, with the phone we thought we were going to need to take roll call vote on everything. But because of that, you can just um, you know do it orally by yeses and noes. So, um, so if, if those who would like to um, vote for the motion say aye. 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 And anybody against? And so your motion passes. Um, so at this point, Mr. Leo, I believe you are now chair, yes? No. Oh, no. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. <laughs> See, we're going to bumble over this. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So now, so now you can continue with it. So you'll go through the same process with the vice chair. And then happily after that, it's all informational items. And there won't be any more motioning and voting for the rest of the night, theoretically. So... <laughs> Okay, um, I'd like to ask if anyone would motion for a vice chairperson. I, mo I motion Mr. Johnson. I'll second that. And you want to call for a vote? Uh, yes, let's call for a vote for vice chair. Yes. Aye. 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 Our chair. Vice chair has been elected. Okay. The chair takes over at this point, which yes. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. So basically at this point, you just follow along with your agenda and you just move on to the next item. And so um, it's at your pleasure. You can either call the item yourself or you can direct us as staff to call it. Uh, I'll defer to the staff to call. Okay. So your next agenda item is agenda item number four, which is a review of the California Brown Act requirements. So we have provided you with a, um, a booklet uh, that's comb bound. You can refer to that at your leisure, but uh, it's basically everything that you need to know about the, the Brown Act, which is your open meetings law. And I'm trying to find my cheat sheet here that I made for myself, so I can't find it. And so now I'm going to have to wing it. That's nice. Okay. Well, luckily I've been around this for a while. Okay. So the most important thing to know about the um, Brown Act is that it is an open meetings law, which means that we are conducting government business out in the open um, so that the public can participate and comment and observe your proceedings, that nothing is done behind closed doors and everybody has the chance to participate. And so to, because that is the base of the law, all the rules basically support that. And so um, your quorum for this committee is four. So if four of you were to get together, that constitutes a meeting. If you talk about agenda business and you don't want to violate the Brown Act by having an illegal meeting, each of your open meetings has to be publicly noticed so that members of the public know to come and, and show up at your meeting. We post those uh, agendas 72 hours prior to the meeting. Um, we found out a little painfully this time, and we apologize for that, that uh, posting it on the city's website is not good enough because not everybody has access to the internet. And so we also have to post paper agendas in several spots around the city, which we have done so um, 72 hours prior to this meeting. So if four of you were to gather and talk about agenda topics that you cover, then you are Ha actually holding an illegal meeting because you haven't noticed it for the public to join you and participate. So you want to avoid doing that. If, the f if four of you are all guests at the same wedding and you just, the only conversation that you have is talking about how tasty the buffet is at the reception, that is not an illegal meeting because you are not discussing city business and it just so happened that the four of you were at the same social event. <clears throat> 
So I just wanted to make that clear what's an illegal meeting and what's okay. So you don't have to worry about like, oh my goodness, there's a committee member meeting or a committee member in the grocery store. I better run it away and avoid them. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. Um, so uh, likewise, another example for you is let's say that you all decided to show up at a city council meeting and make public comment or just observe or whatever, and you happen to bump into each other in the foyer four of you and then you started talking about hey did you see our measure x agenda you know it was posted and that was really crazy and you started having that discussion you were having an illegal meeting so you want to avoid that okay um, the other way that you can have a meeting is by email so that is the reason that we blind copy you on the e or at least attempt to remember to blind copy you on all the emails so that you can't inadvertently reply all if you were to reply all then you're basically holding a meeting because you're talking about something that relates to your meeting and with more than you know a quorum of your uh, membership so we try to protect you by putting you in the blind copy spot so that we can avoid that um, if you were to uh, talk with one other member, so if um, Chair Carpenter wanted to talk to Vice Chair Johnson about something, that's fine. It's only two of you. You can talk about your agenda coming up. That's not an illegal meeting because it's not, uh, it's not a quorum. But let's say the two of you talked with each other, and this could either be face-to-face -face or by email, and then one of you went and talked to member Landa Verde, and then member Landa Verde went and talked to member Leo, then you have constituted a serial meeting, which is um, illegal under the Brown Act. So even though it may not have been intentional, because you didn't think you were violating it, it was started with just the two of you, it could quickly turn into a serial meeting and be illegal at that point. So those are the basics that you need to know for your meetings. Um, let's see, is there anything else? Can you think of anything else that they would be very interested in? I know that I think you hit the point. Seventy-two hours mm -hmm. for, for yeah. forum, yeah, and the serial meeting as well. Yeah. Okay. I think that's pretty much it. But again, you can review your books at your leisure, and it'll give you everything that you need to know about the Brown Act. Okay. Um. And does does anybody have any questions on that agenda item? Uh, I do. Um, if we decide, or one of us decides that we do need to meet. Is that coordinated through you, or how does that take place? I, yeah. I, I, I'm talking outside of our regularly scheduled meetings. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it would be coordinated with staff. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, great. Then I guess, um, can we move on to the next item then? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, okay. And at the pleasure of the chair, I'd like to um, take items five, six, and seven all at the same time because I have it in, in one kind of seamless presentation. That would be fine with me. Okay, if great. There's no other objections. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, government is a little bit different than uh, some of the businesses that you are used to. Some of you have been in and around government, and that's very helpful, but not everybody has. So we're going to go over a few terms just to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. The city runs on a fiscal year that starts with July 1st and ends June 30th. Um, so we don't run on a calendar year, fiscal year, like you do with your, your personal self. Um, our budget is basically the annual spending plan adopted by the city council one year at a time. A city you may know of cities that prepare two-year budgets. The city council is still only adopting the first year of that two-year document. They adopt one year at a time, and then they may come back and then adopt that second year when the time comes for that. But all city councils in the state of, city in the state of uh, California adopt their budgets one year at a time. An appropriation is basically a budgeted expenditure. It's a city council approved expenditure. Um, so we use those terms interchangeably. We'll say expenditure budget or we may say appropriation. Either way, it's the same thing. 
A fund is a separate set of books. So when we say, you know, when we refer to the books, you know, for accounting terms, we're talking about, you know, typically a um, uh, income statement, which shows your revenue and your expenses. In government, we say expenditure. Um, and it also has your balance sheet, your assets and your liabilities. So, um, you know, in, in the corporate world or your personal world, uh, your balance sheet basically looks like assets minus liabilities equals owner's equity. Um, here in government, we have assets minus liabilities equals fund balance, kind of the piggy bank, if you will, amounts that can be spent in future years, amounts set aside in reserve. Um, so that basically covered fund balance. Uh, the uh, city councils can adopt policies to set aside or accumulate those monies for a rainy day. Uh, so we refer to that as a reserve, the general fund reserve, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, restricted revenue. This would be revenue that we get from outside agencies, usually governmental agencies, but it can be other. Most of the time it's federal government, state government, county, or other quasi-governmental agencies um, that has strings attached to it, meaning that we can only spend it for a certain purpose. We can't spend it on anything. General fund, this is the primary operating fund of the city, and this is where we deposit all of our money that is unrestricted, meaning no strings are attached. We can use that money for anything. We can pay for police salaries. We can pay for my salaries. We can buy this equipment here in this room. Does not matter. Any purpose, any legal purpose of the city. Okay. Uh, we have a general fund had a general fund imbalance here at the city prior to Measure X. And this is a really important thing that I want to go over with this committee. Um, what that means is that we were spending more money than what we were taking in. Some people refer to it as a, a budget deficit. Uh, so our 1819 budget, which we're, that is our current fiscal year that we are wrapping up in 12 days from now, um, that budget included the assumption that we were going to use $10 million of the general fund reserve. What this means is that there was a plan to spend $10 million more than what was taken in. So when you spend more than what was taken in, you're reducing your fund balance. So there was a plan to use $10 million of general fund reserve. There was an assumption that in, built into the budget that we would have $1.5 million of cost savings. That Those cost savings were never implemented. And so uh, it was related to employee furloughs. I see you kind of, you know, <laughs> yeah. So um, that's what it was related to. Those were never uh, implemented. And so we did not have that cost savings. Um, the original revenue estimates for that 1819 budget had very high numbers for cannabis revenue, close to $8 million, too high. Um, we have adjusted our revenue estimates since then, but had we um, a, estimated a lower amount of revenue closer to what we're actually going to receive, then we would have been $7.9 million out of balance uh, for that item alone. Then we also had an assumption that we were going to receive $2.1 million of non-recurring revenue for the sale of land. So there's nothing wrong with selling land and, and getting that money into the city's coffers, completely normal, but it's not part of your recurring budget. It's a one-time uh, money. So for example, um, in your personal households, you if you um, got a, a birthday present check from your Aunt Sue, you wouldn't, uh, for $100, you wouldn't run out and subscribe to a new cell phone service for $100 because you only got that check one time. It's the same kind of concept with us. Um, so basically, you can say that our fiscal year 1819 budget started right out of the gate with um, 18, 19 and a half, uh, like a 20, close to a $22 million deficit based on those assumptions right there. Then we have additions to that. Now, this is without Measure X in play. We'll bring that in later. Um, before Measure X, we know that our CalPERS contribution for fiscal year 1920 increases by $8.6 million. CalPERS is the statewide um, California Public Employee Retirement System. It's the, the entity that we contract with to provide our employees with a defined benefit uh, pension. And most cities uh, use CalPERS. 
So this is completely normal. Um, there's reasons for the contribution increases, and we'll get into those later. Um, our Police Officer Association, which is basically our public safety labor group, their compensation increased uh, based on a recently approved uh, agreement with that labor group uh, is increasing by 8.4 million for fiscal year 1920. And then in addition to that, our general liability and workers comp claims that we have actually been paying out have been increasing over the last several years. And we have separate funds where we put aside, we we take money out of the general fund and set it aside to pay those claims. We have been paying out more than what we have been putting into the, those funds. And so as a result, um, we're increasing our recovery charges by a million dollars to the general fund so that we can stop, you know, stop the bleeding on those, um, those uh, liability claims funds. So if you add up all of that, we can kind of say that before Measure X, without Measure X, for the fiscal year 1920 budget, we would have had a $40 million uh, operating deficit. So when the city uh, council and the public discuss how they would like to use the Measure X money, um, which we are estimating to be approximately $60 million per year, we start right out of the gate with a $40 million deficit. So what that means is in loose terms that maybe there might be $20 million left over to spend for um, items that were listed in the Measure X ballot language. The, uh, the, of course, the city council can make changes to the budget to avoid that. So the city council could decide to say, no, we want all new services with the $60, of measure, or $60 million of Measure X money. So therefore, we need to take a look at our budget and decide what other services we want to no longer provide so that we can stay in balance. They'd have to reduce their existing budget by $40 million to bring it back into balance and then layer in the new $60 million of spending for Measure X. They could have gone through that exercise. Um, they could go through that exercise at any point in the future. Okay, so our um, fiscal year 1920 budget, I have a little updated blurb on the uh, corner there, and you have that printed out in front of you, but the version that we had posted along with your agenda was before last night happened, and last night we had a city council meeting and they had made some additional decisions about the budget, and so we've updated the numbers for you there. And so basically what we have, um, and it just might be easier for me to go up there. I hope that you don't mind me moving around. I hate just sitting sitting down anyway. Um, so last night they made a decision to include uh, 25000 of rental assistance, 25000 for a census outreach, 100000 for legal defense, and 110000 for um, some applicants to the CDBG program that didn't get an allocation from that pot of money. So basically what we have here is your um, revenues and expenditures. I'm going to start with the 1819 column right here. And uh, this is the amount of money that we expect to take in. These are our appropriations, our budgeted expenditures. And these are our transfers out. Transfers out mean that we're just taking the money out of the general fund and putting it into other funds to mostly pay for debt service. Um, this is an obligation of the general fund, but our uh, freaky governmental um, financial standards require us to account for those debt service payments in a different fund so sorry that's um, just the way we have to do it it's not it's not our choice we're just following GASB excuse me Catherine yes um, of course it, 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 and I want to make sure I'm uh, um, addressing you the right way mm -hmm. um, is that the appropriate way to just your first name or yeah, that's it, fine mm -hmm. okay so can you please repeat that because I'm, yeah. I'm curious to find out a little bit more specifically about what you just covered sure so um, remember how I talked about the fact that there are um, we have a bunch of different funds. These are discrete sets of financial statements, income statement, and balance sheet, if you will. We call them different things, but it's basically the same thing. 
um, we have a discrete set of books for all these different funds. When we have restricted money, such as if, like, say, the federal government gives us a grant. Um, uh, we were just talking about public safety grants earlier, the UASI grant. They require us to account for that in a separate fund so that we can track that money and they can. it's easier for them to review our expenditures and make sure that we complied with their spending requirements, the, the restrictions that they placed on that revenue. So we are required by governmental accounting standards to account for that money in a separate fund. Just like we're required to do that for restricted revenue, we're also required to do that for debt service payments. So when the city is obligated for debt service, and we do have several items that the, the city's general fund pays debt on, uh, or pays for debt, uh, we are required to account for that in a separate fund. So basically what we do is we transfer the money from the general fund because that is the funding source for those debt service payments. We move it into the debt service fund and then we make those payments out of the debt service fund as required by the governmental accounting standards. It's It just makes it all terribly confusing for the public and I wish it weren't that way, but that is what we are required to do. So I have to explain that each time. So, so really quick, in this particular example, the line item that you're referring to mm -hmm. is expenditures or inner fund transfers out? Inner fund transfers out to be spent in the debt service fund for debt service payments, That's primarily. Right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so you can see that uh, because our revenue estimate for 1819 now includes one quarter of Measure X, which is one quarter of $60 million or $15 million that we have included in on this line item here. Um, we expect to have positive estimated net activity based on our budget. We expect to end up $1.4 in the black at the end of the year, which will add to our fund balance. So we had a beginning fund balance of $56 million. If we were to add $1.4 million to that, we'd have an ending balance of $57.8 million. Here are the City Council's uh, reserve policy. So the City Council has adopted a policy that says that we would like to keep an operating reserve equivalent to two months. Three months would be 25%. <laughs> so equivalent to two months of your operating budget, which is 16.67%. And we'd also like to have a reserve of anywhere from 1% to 10% for economic uncertainty. Um, so these are the minimum reserves uh, per the city council policy, 16.67% or 2% or two months for the operating reserve and 1% for economic uncertainty. So these are percentages of revenue. So if we apply these percentages to the revenue number, these are the uh, requirements that we get. So basically this means that we're required to keep $46 million and some change in the general fund as a reserve according to city council policy. You can think of it as like a rainy day reserve, just like you'd want to keep money in your savings account at home. Same thing. So right here I just basically have a calculation that says that we think we're going to end here minus the minimum that we're supposed to keep on hand means this is the amount that we may have in excess in the general fund. So now, with that understanding, we can move forward to fiscal year 1920. This is our budget as it currently stands, updated with last night's decisions, and it shows that we would be in the black by um, 660,000, which is a tiny, tiny narrow margin on um, you know $316 million budget. And so with that 660,000, we'd be increasing the general fund balance a little bit. Here's something very interesting. So our reserve policy is based on a percentage of our revenues. So if our revenues go up, our reserve requirement goes up. And so with that higher fund balance, we have a higher reserve uh, requirement. And so we have less excess le left over. Um, so there's a lot going on on this slide, and so I'll pause to allow you to ask questions at this point. So if I'm clear, even with the Measure X, the $45 million extra, mm -hmm. we only have $660,000. Correct, and that's primarily due to the $40 million operating deficit that we started with. So who is going to communicate that to the taxpayers that, yes, we voted for a tax increase, but we got nothing? Mm -hmm. And if I saw this correctly... 
the city council just approved 8.6 million no 8.4 million for a contract uh, and refused to cut 1.5 million do the cost savings so 10 million dollars spent or not saved due to that and so the taxpayers i'm trying to understand so the taxpayers are footing the bill for mismanagement by the council i'm, I'm just asking that general question just so i understand because when i signed up for this i didn't realize how bad this was mm -hmm. and they just made it worse mm -hmm. um i I'm staff. Uh, I'm not so, asking you to say anything negative. You. I'm just saying, <laughs> am I reading it correctly? That we're you, spending you are way more than, and on top of that, they're afraid to make a small $1.5 million cut. If I'm reading this correctly. You are reading it correctly. Okay. That's all I needed to know. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have a question. Yes, of course. If I, if I may have a question also, uh, Executive Director. Um, so on, on, the, on the prior slide, I'm trying to reconcile the... Um, your $1.4 million expected estimated net activity mm -hmm. for the fiscal year. Yes. And compare that to um, you know, the, the, the high level 18, 19 budget items mm -hmm. that you went through, which mm -hmm. uh, from, from my math on the 1819, I think that adds up to 22 million. Mm -hmm. um, and assuming that the $15 million, which is the one quarter of our estimated $60 million major X money comes in, the, that that should be a seven million dollar delta mm -hmm. versus and so i'm trying to reconcile seven million to the 1.4 yeah um, and so I, what, I what, why where, is that not uh mm -hmm. what, why is that math not um, drive out our our base sales tax and we're going to talk about sales tax differences um in a few slides but our base sales tax the sales tax that we were already receiving pre-measure x um we estimated that that is actually we're actually going to receive 3.4 million more than what we had previously estimated and there's there's other minor changes as well and that would pretty much that makes up the lion's share of the delta Okay. So, so essentially, we're, we're, we also underestimated the actual amount of revenue that we're receiving. Exactly. By, by how much? I didn't catch the number. By how much? Three point four million. Three point four million on just the base sales tax, and then there were some other uh, revenue estimate changes as well. Got it. And uh, I'm sorry. Another question on the on the next slide on mm -hmm. your the the fund the general sure. fund balance. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm understanding this also because there's definitely a correlation between the um, the, the council policy on the operating reserves and the economic, economic uncertainty reserve that obviously the more revenue you bring in, the, um, the, more, um, the, the more that you have in your reserves. And so we, we are going from a, a general fund Reserve so in excess of the policy, which it sounds like that's at the minimum policy right now because you had indicated that the economic uncertainty reserve is between between one percent and ten percent. That is correct. And so that's the minimum that we're yes. they're at. It sounds like there might be a desire to have that be at a a larger reserve at some point. Yeah, there's um, so when you when you develop a reserve policy. Um, you're basically mitigating risk. Uh, you're you're mitigating the risk that um, you know you'll you'll be able to have some money uh, um, to continue operations if some of your revenues uh, decrease unexpectedly, like if you went into a um, a recession and your sales tax went down. Um, so you're basically mitigating risk with this reserve policy. When you set up a reserve policy, you typically go through an exercise where you try to quantify your risk and then determine where it is that your reserve policy should be. Now, the way that you do that is uh, you quantify things like, okay, um, maybe our property tax, we don't get that for the first several months of the year. We get it later on in the fiscal year. So those we've, we've got to be able to have enough cash flow to operate for those first few months before we receive our property tax revenue. That would be an example of, of something that would go into your analysis for determining where your reserve policy should be set at. 
My point is um, not to walk you through that process, but my point is to tell you that there is a process behind it. The policy that the City Council adopted in 2017 for the Economic Uncertainty Reserve, um, you know, you're right, it says 1% to 10%. I did an analysis of sales tax, and I mean, I'm not the end-all be-all, and this is the City Council's policy, but on my own, I took a look at the history of the city's sales tax and kind of looked at, you know, what happened during the um, Great Recession in 08-09, what happened when there was a payment anomaly from the state, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, um, where these things that happened over history, at what level should we have had this economic uncertainty reserve to deal with sales tax. And usually that component of a reserve is directly tied to sales tax because sales tax is, is your, ba your biggest revenue source that it fluctuates with the economy a lot. And it's the most volatile. And so when I did that analysis, I, I realized that at any point in time, a 1% reserve would have been sufficient to cover over those downturns in the sales tax. Now that's just my analysis. That isn't a fully vetted process. That's not something that went to the city council for discussion. This is their policy. But you know, maybe there's an argument out there that maybe it doesn't need to be 10%. When you have a large budget like the, like the city of Santa Ana does, um, you don't necessarily uh, need a larger percentage because your budget is so large, you, you really need to look at dollars, as it were. Um, the best way that I can describe it, and, and just bear with me for a moment, I, I'll, I'll try to keep these to a minimum. Um, I had a saltwater fish tank for a while. If you have a small saltwater fish tank, it's hard to keep your chemical levels in balance. If you have a large saltwater fish tank, it's easier to keep your chemical levels in balance. They're subject to less um, disruption, if you will. You can keep them within a tolerance range. Um, it's the same thing when you have a large budget. If you are looking at a, a percentage of your revenues, you you know you may have a, a earthquake, and you may need to do some immediate response before you start getting in FEMA dollars, but that may not be 10% of your annual budget. Maybe it's because you have such a large budget, maybe it's only 1%. But the bottom line is a full risk analysis is the way that you establish a reserve. And so, you know, maybe once we get past a couple other projects with the city council and, and with the city, as my department's very busy right now, um, we've got a lot of fish to fry, which is, you know, a lot of fun for us. Um, once we get past some of those things, that is something that I would like to, um, you know, go back to the city council with and just say, hey, would you like to relook at this policy and let's look at some of the driving factors behind how we go about establishing that according to best practices. So it's just food for thought. Uh, th th thank you for that. I would just just from my my experience in in times of of, of rising revenue that we're obviously that we have right now, that's the opportunity time opportune time to be able to make increases to these types of uh, reserves. Mm -hmm. um, and it worries me that um, that we're at the bottom of that. Not, I'm not saying that it needs to be at 10%, and I'm not saying it's, it needs to be at 10% overnight, um, but I would encourage that, um, that risk analysis to be done, um, especially in, in times of, of, rising, of rising tides, where we have a lot of water metaphors here, um, but in times of rising tides, you have to uh, sock, sock things away uh, because you know, right now, I mean, I mean the, the, gra the graphs will show it. We are mm -hmm. receiving more revenue on the sales tax side, and yet we are uh, stuck on that same minimum reserve level. Yeah, and um, I couldn't agree more so with you. This, this is a, the opportune time to be able to do that. I'm disappointed that we're, um, that we have a eight point uh, uh, eight point seven million dollar reduction essentially to the city's savings account, uh, mm -hmm. which is effectively what the general fund um, um, is. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that, that, that's that's disappointing. That uh, not only are we projecting future deficits, but we're uh, you know we have a huge uh, defic deficiency right out of the gate. So yeah.
Thank you. Yeah, and I and I would love to tackle it uh, quicker, and maybe I can find a way to do so. But we've we've got some very um, serious things that we need to deal with here at the city. Um, for example, we've got some systems, some very key systems to the whole entire operation of the city that are no longer supported. I mean, so we're running on unsupported systems, and so I'm trying to put my finger in many places in the dike right now. I've got my work cut out for me. I'm sorry, I'm going to ask, ask another question. Of course. On the, uh, the, the $1.5 million cost savings that were not implemented, was that, mm -hmm. um, obviously that was part of the 18-19 budget, so Correct. that was uh, uh, part, part of the plan this time last year, so 12 months ago. Um, I mean, ordinarily that would, you know, when you have that, uh, you know, a decision is made, then you're going to start making, uh, implementing the, those those cost savings in a relatively quick fashion. Um, was that was this 1.5 million cost savings uh, predicated upon Measure X not passing? So, for example, hey, we will, you know, we'll cut the 1.5 if X doesn't pass, um, or was it? Um, you know, I, and I, I don't remember those discussions happening at this time last year uh, uh, in, in, in council uh, type discussions, but uh, it's very possible they did. But um, I mean, is that was that the plan for that going into this? That let's wait and see what happens with uh, the the major X election. I honestly don't know um, because I arrived in October. I, I wasn't part of those discussions when this budget was developed, and so I don't know the answer to that. Sergio, do you? Yes. Um, Thank you for your question, Vice Chair. Uh, those discussions were had during the on the run up to the eighteen nineteen budget process. Um, in terms of implementation, uh, that was really the coordinated with the city manager and human resources as to when the implementation would take place. Um, at that time, a decision was made in the event that Measure X more than likely would not pass. Then those that decision would be expedited, uh, but the city was still cognizant of dealing with that situation and reaching out to its uh, its bargaining units during that time. But in essence, the decision, I don't know if there was a formal decision that came out. Um, however, the, the timing of that was, was continuously being discussed as, as information was arriving. We also, want, the city also wanted to see how were the first quarter numbers coming in before taking any action during the year as well. Um, th 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 thank you for that, um, Mr. Vidal. Um, I, I mean, quite honestly, though, I mean, any type, whenever you're budgeting for a, a $10 million deficit from the onset, um, I think we can agree that having a little bit of additional revenue is probably not going to, uh, you know, make a whole lot of dent in, um, in, in other, other types of decisions. Essentially, you're bailing water um, at that point. Um, but I, I understand, um, obviously, we're, we're looking at hindsight right now. Okay, lots, lots to discuss. Uh, so this is a 10-year look at our general fund expenditures. Um, you'll notice that the trend line takes a dip down and then it comes back up. That first dip down is after the Great Recession. So um, one of the city's primary uh, revenue sources is sales tax and so um, that was impacted by the recession and so the city reacted and brought expenditures down to fit within revenues or fit closer to revenues I should say and then after that um, as we've had recovery, those expenditures have gone back up. So if you look at the beginning point of that 10 years and the ending point of that 10 years, we go from 232 million to 246 million, which is a 6% increase over that 10 year period. Um, so our average increase over the last five years has been 5% per year. Just to clarify, uh -huh. that's six percent um, in in real dollars from point A to point B. Not, Correct. Not in the, but it's five percent over the last five years on an annual basis. You got it. So um, back to a little bit of terminology for you. This isn't so much terminology as just uh, state law, as it were. But I, I want to make sure that you guys understand some of these concepts. So. Um, the, the basics on our revenue sources. Um, so we have general taxes. General taxes are sales tax, our hotel visitors tax, business tax, etc. 
These are general taxes that can be used for any purpose, like what we talked about before. These kinds of taxes require a majority vote at election, just like Measure X required a simple majority. That's what uh, that is our state law for general taxes. Special taxes, those that are um, restricted to a specific purpose. So if we went to our voters and asked them to pass a tax for street repair, it's only to be used for street repair. That is a restricted tax because you're putting a restriction on the money. You can't pay my salary with it. You're just going to repair streets. That special tax requires a two-thirds majority at the ballot box um, when it's restricted for a specific use. Then we have property-related fees. Um, there is Proposition 218 that sets out our law for doing mail ballot elections for those property-related fees, um, or we can do a majority protest hearing. Probably the one that you're most familiar with seeing would be sewer rate increases. So if your sewer rates increase, um, there is a majority protest hearing, meaning that the city council holds a public hearing. If they receive a majority written protest from those be, you know, paying the fee, then they could not impose the fee. Logistically, we know that that's just about impossible because that would require how many thousands of people to show up at a city council meeting and provide a written protest to the city council. So in reality, it never happens, um, but that but that is the law, the majority protest hearing. Um, user fees. So this would be where the city charges you for a specific service. It's not being provided to everybody. You come in and you ask for a permit. You ask us to look at your building plans, and we do a plan check. That is a service that was provided just to you. Um, that is a user fee. We are uh, bound by law that we cannot collect more than our cost to provide that service. So we actually have to go through calculations to determine, okay, it takes that staff member 15 minutes to do that thing, that staff member five minutes to review it. it we use 10 pieces of paper at 25 cents each, et cetera, et cetera. We, we go through these kind of costing calculations to determine what is our cost of providing that service, and we can't establish our fees at an amount higher than that. So we can only recover our costs. We can't make money on it. Property rental. Um, that can be at market rate, and this is the one area that we have full control over for our revenues, and um, this is an area where we actually could make money on it if we wanted to but we're in the business of government, and for public policy reasons, we often don't make money. Usually these are, amount, um, these are uh, things that are heavily subsidized. I'll give you an example. Um, we have a property that we own in downtown. It's called Grand Central? Grand Central. Yeah, Grand Central. And we lease that to university for a dollar a year for public policy reasons, not because we're trying to make money off of that property. So that kind of thing happens all the time. But that, but property rental is the one area that we do have full control over, where we don't have to go to the pro, uh, voters, we don't have to go through public hearings, protest votes, et cetera, et cetera. A quick question on that property rental: When you say that we're running, the city is running that property for a dollar a year. Mm -hmm. Is the city also picking up all the maintenance and? everything else that goes along with the property? I know that we do provide some maintenance, but not all. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, thank you for your question, Chair. Uh, this, the Grand Central property that's being referenced is in down, the, the downtown area of the city. Um, the city did contribute uh, capital repair maintenance, but the ongoing maintenance is by the landlord, which is the university, as, as the director mentioned. So it's fair to say that we're taking a loss on the property every year? We, we still own it as an asset. Um, no, if, but as, a, as, a, as an income, we're taking a loss, correct? That is true because, yes, if a window breaks, we're over there fixing the window. And we're not getting full market value, obviously. Correct. Okay. For public policy reasons. I'm sorry, for? For public policy reasons. More like public relations reasons? Would that be a more accurate term? I'm staff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the next slide is um, a little bit of history about our property tax. And the reason that I'm going to hit property tax is because it's our one other uh, most significant revenue source to our general fund. So just between sales tax and property tax alone, you're looking at roughly half 
of our general fund revenue. So that's why I'm going to hit on this one real quick. Um, so what we have here is 10 years. Uh, it includes nine years of actual data plus two years of estimate. Um, and we've seen a 3% average annual increase. As you know, um, based on Proposition 13, your assessed value on your property cannot increase any more than 2% uh, each year. But we get a little bit more of a pickup because what happens is when a property sells, then it's reassessed. And so when you average out everybody else creeping up at 2% a year, plus those properties that turned over and sold, and we get more property tax, that's why we have the 3% average annual increase. Our consultant, and we do have a consultant who does this uh, projection for us, uh, it says that for 1920, we might see a 3.9% increase, so a little bit better than the uh, average 10-year history. That's a little uh, image of your property tax dollar, and basically it shows you that for every dollar of the base property tax that you pay, um, about 64% uh, goes to education, various pots, K through 12, community college, districts, et cetera, et cetera. 17% uh, goes to the county, and roughly 19% goes to the city. So just, just a little bit of education for you. And property tax uh, is 26% of the general fund revenue for 1819. Excuse me. Yes. Um, what, what, are we, what are you projecting in the 1920 or, uh, budget that was discussed last night? Is that 3.9? Yes, 3.9. 3.9, mm -hmm. okay. So, so you utilize the consultant mm -hmm. to be able to project mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. And the reason we use a consultant is because the consultant actually goes through an analysis where they get a hold of um, sales data. Uh, for the, there's lots of parcels in the city, and they analyze that and determine you know what they think we're going to increase by. It's it's a it's a laborious process. I used to do it myself for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and that was a very small city, and it was a very big uh, job. So I'm glad we're using a consultant here. <laughs> Is there a, that same consultant or another um, position within the city that identifies underutilized uh, parcels to be able to, um, you know, that effectively have a very uh, very low property tax basis? They're not being they're not performing uh, for the you know proper use so for example a dirt lot mm -hmm. um, you know with a chain link fence around it for example mm -hmm. um, does that consultant do that type of work also no. or is, it, is there another group inside the city that, that identifies and tries to the planning and building okay. department mm -hmm. okay so here's a breakdown of your uh, sales tax rate here in the city of Santa Ana so we have a base rate of 7.75%, which is what was in place before Measure X uh, became effective April 1st. 6% goes to the state, 0.75 to the county, and 1% to the city. Um, going forward, because we are going to track Measure X separately, I am going to be a stickler about referring to these two uh, sales tax sources separately so the law the state law that gave that the city that one percent share that we've always had is the bradley burns law and so i'm going to refer to that you know pre-measure x tax as our sales tax bradley burns you know that's our bradley burns allocation so that's our 7.75 percent base rate then of course the uh, city's voters passed measure x and so that's how we arrive at our new rate of 9.25 percent and as a reminder um measure x decreases from the 1.5 down to 1.1 1 .1 percent flat in 2029 and it sunsets in 2039 Okay, so just like we looked at a history of property tax, we're looking at a history of sales tax. And of course, this is history, so that means we're talking about the Bradley Burns allocation. Um, and that is 20% of general fund revenue. So again, we have um, 10 years or nine years of actual data and two years of estimate. We've had a 4.7% average annual increase. Oh, our consultant, a different consultant um, who specializes in sales tax is predicting only a 0.4% increase for 1920. Um, I you know, I'm sure you, if you read the news at all, um, you know that the 
uh, countries' economists are predicting a recession. In, you know, two thirds of them. I read a, one account uh, say that during 2020 we're going to see our next recession. So this is a great indicator of that. Um, our uh, sales tax consultant is predicting that we're pretty much going to level off for 1920. That we're not going to have a whole lot of growth there. Um, that little dip that you see right there, it's kind of an anomaly. It's not real. Um, a couple of or a couple in the last two years, um, up at the state where they collect the sales tax and remit it to cities, that was the Board of Equalization. The Board of Equalization duties have now gone over to a new department name called California Department of Tax and Fee Administration (CDTFA), and um, they implemented a new computer system. And so with all the confusion of new people in charge and a new computer system, they uh, didn't give us some money uh, at when it was due to us and it came in later. And so we have this anomaly where there's like a dip in our revenues and then it picks up and they, they, they catch up. They give us a catch up payment. Um, that catch up payment is contributing to um, why we, uh, th you know, estimated changed our uh, sales tax revenue estimate for this year for the three point four million. That's that's part of that. So I just like to point out that that's just a weird anomaly. Um, over the last ten years, our growth in sales tax, because of course these come from different sectors. We collect sales tax retail, restaurants, um, you know, at the gas station, etc. Etc. And so uh, you had your highest growth in the segments of state and county pool, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, and business to business sales. Um, that was where we saw the highest growth. State and county pool. So uh, that's primarily, there's, there's also some other things dumped into there, but that is primarily internet sales. So what happens is internet sales goes into these state and county pools, and then those state and county pools allocate out a share of that sales tax revenue to cities based on your share of the pool before the allocation. Um, don't know that it makes a whole lot of sense, but that's the way it's done. So we're talking about like on online sales from out of state where there's no physical presence. That's if there's a physical presence and the sale is made at that location, then it's allocated to that jurisdiction, and that's why we're talking about primarily online sales. Um, your next meeting, we expect to have our sales tax consultant here to make a presentation to you. So if you want to know about all the ins and outs of sales tax allocation and how it's done here in California, that would be a wonderful time to ask them the, those questions. Um, does anybody have any further questions on this slide? Y yes, I do. Um, so are we, you know, obviously we, uh, I think on the bottom you're, you're maybe have calendar years, but um, we're on a, you know, those fiscal are fiscals. Year. Are, is it, did, yeah, so it's you fiscal refer year to and fiscal ending. Yeah. Okay. Um, so ending ending nineteen, it looks like you're projecting about fifty one million mm -hmm. or or so. Mm -hmm. um, so fifty one million is Brad, the one percent Bradley Burns. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that you know when we're talking to the sixty million X portion, which is one and a half percent of that, are we underestimating that at sixty million? Because I mean, just mathematically, that'd be closer to like seventy five million. Um, mm -hmm. And I see where you're going with that, and I'm actually shocked that nobody has asked me that question in public up until this point in time. So there actually is a very good reason for it, and most of it has to do with the state and county pools. So the state and county pool allocation to the city is currently about 15% of our sales tax. That does not apply to a local district tax you don't the um so like when the the voters pass this one and a half percent measure x we don't go to the the county pool and say okay we get another percent and a half you know uh, based on our percent and a half we get more allocation no it's only applied to the bradley burns and because our bradley burns 15 percent of it is those pools that's why you see the difference what, what goes into uh determining um allocation of the the the, the pool um 
when they divvy it up to various uh, jurisdictions? Um, before the allocation, let's say that a, a total of a hundred million was allocated statewide, and one million went to the city of Santa Ana. We have a one percent share of everything that was allocated. Then they say, okay, they look in their pool and they say, okay, our pool has a hundred thousand dollars to allocate, so we're going to give Santa Ana one percent of that. I'm so sorry, it's, how, how is the one percent determined? Uh, it's our think, our it, share of total sales tax that's allocated prior to okay. the, them applying the the allocation of the pool. So th this is just pure mathematically uh, derived, it. as opposed to uh, there's no. Um, it's not a policy okay. issue. It's mathematical. Yep. Okay. So yes, of course. Do you know if? Do you know if the other cities who pass sales taxes mm -hmm. in Orange County, there have been several, mm -hmm. do you know if they're projecting the same basically very modest increase in sales tax? Like Fountain Valley is more of a bedroom community kind of compared to Santa Ana, but like you look at the other cities that have passed it, are they projecting the same thing? Are they using the same consultants? I'm just wondering, like, I believe our consultants are correct that mm -hmm. things are going to flatten out, mm -hmm. but are other ones going beyond? I'm, I'm just wondering, like, mm -hmm. are we in the ballpark with everybody else mm -hmm. or, or not? That's mm -hmm. my question. Yeah. The short answer to your question is yes. Um, here's a little bit more for you. Uh, there are two main players in the state that do this uh, sales tax consultant. One is called um, Uni Services. That's who we use. And one is HDL. That's who I used at my last city. Um, they're both very, very competent consultants, but there's two in the state. They're basically saying, the same thing and most every city uses one of these two consultants and um, yeah I, I guess that's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so the sales tax producers here in the uh, city of Santa Ana is um, transportation business to business food products you have more information about this in your agenda packet um, I should have been referring to some of these page numbers before because it'd be fun for you to see some of this stuff. Okay, maybe I'm kind of nerdy. Uh, let's see. Pages 6 and 7 of your agenda packet. Um, they, this is information uh, from our sales tax consultant that can be shared with the public. And so it gives you a little bit of information, a little bit of history about some of the segments, who our top 25 sales tax generators are. You'll notice if you look at page 6 that those top 25 are listed in alphabetical order. There's a really good reason for that. Sales tax information in the state of California is confidential. So we cannot publish any information that would enable somebody to deduce what the amount of sales that a company has. So for instance, 7-Eleven, and I can tell you that that's a conglomeration of all the 7-Elevens in the city. 7-Eleven um, is listed first because it has a number in its name, but I can't present it in any way that allows you to determine roughly how much they would have in sales. So all I can tell you is that they're in the top 25 list. They may be at the bottom, they may be at the top, or somewhere in the middle. Um, so we're very, very careful about what information that we release to the public because we could get ourselves into trouble very quickly. Um, but those are your uh, producers. Let's see here. There was something else that I wanted to refer to. Oh, yeah, back on the sales tax rate. So if you look at page 11 and 12 of your agenda packet, you'll see, just in case you were curious, it's not that big of a deal, but you'll, you'll get to see all of the sales tax rates um, throughout the state for cities that have passed local district taxes. So on page 11, upper right-hand corner, Orange County, you'll see that uh, Fountain Valley, Garden Grove, La Habra, La, ha La Palma, Placentia, Santa Ana, Seal Beach, Stanton, and Westminster have all passed local. And if you haven't passed a local one, then you have the Orange County rate of 7.75. And let me make sure that I didn't miss anything else that I wanted to point out to you guys. No, okay. All right. So Measure X ballot language. Um, just a reminder, the Measure X is a, uh, is a general tax. It passed with a simple majority. 
You can see on the ballot language here that these are the types of things that they ask their voters, you know, would you pass this tax so that we can maintain effective 911 response, retain uh, firefighters and police officers, although we don't have any firefighters. I thought that was interesting. Um, <clears throat> addressing homelessness, fixing streets, maintaining parks, youth and senior services, and unrestricted general revenue purposes. There's the fine print for you in case you were interested. Um, so it's all of those things plus unrestricted general revenue, per general fund purposes, um, which is basically, uh, you know, fixing your deficit. I, I'm just being very honest with you. Um, if the City Council uh, were interested in setting this Measure X revenue aside and saying, nope, nope, nope. Uh, we've heard, we, we hear a lot of public speakers at our meetings that they want to use this money for the, this, that, and the other thing. So we want to set it aside and just use it for this, that, and the other thing, that we've heard a lot of public comment about that. If they did that and they set aside that money, there would be a very good legal argument that now it is a special tax and should have required a two-thirds vote to pass because it comes with restrictions it's only going to be spent on this that or the other thing now does that make sense okay the measure X ordinance um, we've provided a copy in your agenda packet pages 13 through 20 it's the full language you can read that at your leisure um, later but Technically, our Measure X, even though we refer to it as a sales tax, because that's what it looks like when you go to a store and you pay it, um, it is really a transactions and use tax. It's, a, it's legally a little bit different than your Bradley Burns sales tax. So Bradley Burns is impo or that, that our allocation of that sales tax is imposed on the buyer, and there's different allocation rules for it. This transaction and use tax is imposed on the seller. So for most of the revenue that we receive, it's not going to look any different than sales tax. You walk into um, Macy's and you buy a, a pair of jeans, you pay the, the higher rate, it's collected and distributed the exact same way as that base 775, if you will. Um, but there are some slight differences uh, that th if you have questions on that, I, I would encourage you to ask our sales tax consultant because they do this all day long and they can answer your very technical questions if you have them. But suffice it to say, the lion's share of our revenue is going to be distributed exactly like sales tax and, and look just like that. Okay. And then we've got the reminder here that the first 10 years, we have the 1.5 rate. The second 10 years, we have the it decreases. And then it sunsets in 2039. Implementation of Measure X. So one of the first things that we had to do was contract with the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, CDTFA, um, to collect that tax for us and give it to us because they're just not going to do it out of the kindness of their hearts. They have to hire staff and, and you know devote resources to be able to, to give us our money. Uh, they are charging us an initial cost to set up that arrangement. They've told us it'll be no more than 175000 They haven't sent us the invoice yet, so we don't know how much it's going to be, but we know it's not going to be any more than 175000 There is a recurring cost for that service, but we don't know how much that is either because they can't tell us. So as soon as we know, we'll share it with you if you're interested. <clears throat> The uh, CDTFA distributes sales tax to the cities on a monthly basis. Um, the, uh, the, I'll spend a couple minutes talking about this. So sales tax in the state of California, uh, they have, the state requires, when you go, when you're a business, I need to back up here, I'm so sorry. When you're a business, and you, let's say you open up a store and you say, oh, I need to start collecting sales tax. You go to the state and you get a permit to start collecting that sales tax. Based on what it is that you do, how much money you think you're going to bring in, the, sale, the, the state will issue you a reporting 
frequency. They'll either ask you to report annually if you're just going to bring in a very tiny amount, or they may ask you to report quarterly your sales tax, or they may ask you to report monthly. Most of your big sales tax producers are reporting on a monthly basis. They're not reporting on a quarterly basis. Um, so, But with that said, the uh, CDTFA operates on a quarterly model. And what that means is for the first month of the, that you're, so let's talk about, it'll be so much easier if we just talk about April through June of this year. So our tax went into effect April 1st. So let's talk about April, May, and June of 2019. We will receive our April payment in June. We'll receive our May payment in July. We'll receive our June payment in August. So it's a couple months behind, but we won't re we won't necessarily receive the exact amount of our revenue for month one in that quarter. We receive what the, the state refers to as an advance because some sales taxpayers are paying on a quarterly basis. And so at the end of the quarter, there's a true up where they now know the total amount of sales tax due to you and they give you a true up payment. So what that looks like is if you flip to pages eight and nine of your agenda packet, you can see an example of what that looks like, where each quarter they give us a first advance, a second advance, and then they give us a cleanup payment. And so that's the, that's the rhythm that they pay in. Advance, advance, true up. Advance, advance, true up. They have a formula for how they determine that advance. They give you 30% of your, so they, they look at your prior year quarter, that same quarter, so April, May, and June, we're talking about second quarter of calendar 2019. They would look at your prior year, second quarter, and they would deduct anomalies, weird things that happened, and then they would take 30% of that amount and send it to you as your first advance payment. Your second advance payment is another 30%, and then your true up payment is the balance. So we um, don't have a quarter from last year because the tax was just implemented. So the um, CDTFA doesn't have anything to look at to apply their formula to. So today we got the statement of what we are receiving for April payments because it's June, and that just came out today. And so we were kind of curious, like, hmm, you know, what are they going to send us? Because they can't send us 30% of last year because we didn't have anything last year. So we got um, $4,175,000, 4, roughly. Uh, so almost $4.2 million, a little bit less than $4.2 million. So I was really pleased by that. I didn't know exactly how much they were going to... Um, they were going to send us, but that's what they sent us. And, and that's of uh, that's not Bradley Burns. That's uh, that's Measure X allocation, right? This is all Measure X. Yes, that is. Yeah, Measure X. So that's good news, because um, I know that we were very worried about our initial estimate of sixty million. Like, well, are we really going to collect sixty million? I don't know, um, but maybe we might, because uh, my past experience with that state agency is that they are very conservative, and so I'm not alarmed at all. Because you might say to yourself, "Hmm, four point two million times three is only uh, twelve point six million, and oh, we estimated fifteen million. Maybe you're going to be a couple million dollars short." I'm actually not too worried about that right now because I'm I, I think I based on my past experience with the state it would be normal for them to to kind of be very very conservative with what they send us so I'm actually delighted at this amount um, that it's close to 4.2 million that tells me that maybe our 60 million estimate isn't that far off so we'll know with more experience but um, I was very happy about that Okay, uh, so as we know, Measure X is going to be separately reported. We already talked about the fact that this information is confidential um, by business. We can talk about by segment. We can talk about um, in total. Uh, we can even identify the top 25 for you, but that's about where it ends. 
And then um, our sales tax consultant, what they really provide for us is sales tax analytics, and they follow up with any anom anomalies. So basically, they uh, this business isn't paying. What happened? Did they shut down? You know, they, they follow up with all those leads. They go to the CDTFA on our behalf and um, get them to correct their distributions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically what they're doing for us. Vehicle Incentive Program. So in conjunction with Measure X, the City Council adopted this program. It ends March 31st, 2024, so it's a five-year program. And basically, the I think there was some concern that once our sales tax rate went up, that people would stop buying cars in the city of Santa Ana because then they can go to another city and it's cheaper for them. They don't have to, to pay as much sales tax. So the city council said, okay, for our Santa Ana residents, if you are leasing or buying a new or used vehicle, we're gonna give you a $500 rebate. So um, that comes with an expected annual cost of 1.7 million. And there it is. And, and from what I understand, we have not made that first rebate payment yet. Um, but they have the dealers have been providing them. So I, I guess the way it's working is that the dealers are giving the $500 credit to everybody. And then they're going to compile information, give it to us. They do have to prove residency. And, um, and then we will cut them a check to reimburse them for those credits. So this is our Measure X aligned spending in the current fiscal year. The reason that I'm even providing this to you is there has been discussion in the public realm about, um, you know, well, we want our Measure X money to be on new things. We don't want it to supplant existing services. And so what we did, and this is just purely informational only, is we tried to quantify for you what our current spending is here at the city before Measure X in the current budget um, that is aligned with the language that was in the ballot measure. So remember the retaining police officers, um, you know, maintaining effective 911 response, youth services, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, we've tried to quantify that for you here. I can tell you this is not a perfect calculation by any means, but it kind of gives you an idea of what our existing level of effort is that it lines up with the uh, ballot language. Um, just in case you're interested, um, like, let's look at an example, that top line, Santa Ana Police, 16% calls for homelessness because uh, our homeless uh, homeless addressing homelessness was part of the ballot language so our dispatchers actually track our police calls and 16 percent of the calls are indeed to address homeless issues and so all we did for this imperfect calculation just to give you a rough idea is based on that data we said okay if 16 percent of the calls are, are to address homeless issues then 16 um, percent of field operations the operations of those out in the field not like the chief of the chief's office administration but field operations what does that look like and that's about 10 million dollars 16 percent of field operations operations. So that's how we went through and, and did the best that we could to quantify this. Um, you know, the second line item there is an example, uh, police deputy chief um, Gaminsky, he 10% of his time is allocated or dedicated to addressing homeless issues. He's part of the quality of life team and, and addresses those issues on a regular basis. So purely informational existing level of effort. Everything's accounted for with fixing streets, so we don't have any specific line for fixing streets. Correct. The general fund does not spend any money on fixing streets. We use all restricted money for that. Okay. So, so question. Mm -hmm. So going forward, since Measure X requires expenditures on fixing streets. Well, it doesn't we require. require. No, I know, but yeah. mm -hmm. if we want to be honest with the public, it mm -hmm. says, Sure. We'll need to figure out as we have our discussions about how that plays out because mm -hmm. if we're true to ourselves about the sales tax and what, we, what the voters are told, something's got to go to either fixing sidewalks or bottles or whatever mm -hmm. out of Measure X to be honest with the voters. I mean, I'm just sure. extrapolating because everything else, 
you're absolutely right, is listed mm -hmm. in that ordinance. And if someone were to come in and check, yes, we're spending the money appropriately. But mm -hmm. then someone could ask, well, where's the money for fixing streets? Mm -hmm. And we would say, uh, and since that's on us to be the oversight, yep. I'm, I'm just raising the question now as we mm -hmm. go forward. Yep, it's a good question, and you're on the right track, and you can absolutely address that going forward in your recommendations to city council. And I want, I want to clarify a statement that you made that um, the streets are part of um, a, a, a separate fund, um, but that doesn't, that's not required, meaning, Correct. meaning that, I mean, it can be a general fund expense, it just historically has not been a general fund expense because mm -hmm. their, their, our city is, um, utilizes grant money and other restricted mm -hmm. sources. So this is, it's not a, that it can't be, it's a choice that it hasn't been a priority in the general fund budget. That, that's absolutely correct, and I'll take it one step further for you in that if those same restricted monies are available, they would be restricted to fixing streets, so we would use that, those monies to fix streets. And then if you wanted to use general fund money as well to fix streets, then you would be fixing more streets than you are today. So, And, and um, to piggyback off of a, a separate but related issue on, on the streets, is there... Um, any sort of relation with the M2 issue that we're having mm -hmm. on, on uh, that we're not utilizing general fund money to fix streets and so now we're in a little bit of a pickle mm -hmm. with uh, with our M2 funding yeah. through the county yeah so um, you're absolutely correct the the county uh, collects some revenues and distributes it to cities uh, through the OCTA Orange County Transportation Authority and um, the it's the M2 funding it's a restricted funding that can only be used to fix our streets and we get about five million bucks a year on that program and we recently uh, did not meet our maintenance of effort requirement and what that means is that OCTA has placed rules that says okay in order for us to give you this money this restricted money for fixing streets we want to make sure that you are maintaining your right-of-way streets roadways um, with general fund money now their definition of maintaining the right-of-way includes things like street sweeping traffic signal maintenance the electricity for traffic signals um, all of those things it's the the maintenance of all of the the right-of-way if you will so even though the general fund has not historically used general fund money to fix streets, and I'll define that by fixing pavement, yes. um, there has been general fund money that has been used to maintain the right of way. So we didn't spend enough to meet the maintenance of effort requirement. And so they've basically put our M2 funding on hold until we come back into compliance. So we're working through that right now. And if all goes according to plan, we will be back in compliance as of January of 2020. And we expect that at that time, OCTA will release the money that they've held for us during the time that we were out of compliance. And so basically what happens is we have a cash flow issue that has been created. We just get paid later than what we were expecting to get paid. But that's if we come back into compliance. And the way that we come back into compliance is we have to go through a very, I'll just say it candidly, nasty audit um, that we expect to go through in de uh, December, late December, early January. And we have to pass that very nasty audit with flying colors. So we're doing everything that we can in finance to make sure that that happens because we certainly do not want to see the city lose $5 million. Is it, is it a dollar for dollar match? There's, it's a number that they give us, and it's actually more than what we get. We're supposed to be basically spending eight million dollars of general fund to money get to get the five. And, and as far as what you just told us, we're spending restricted funds and not eight million. Or we are spending other money in the budget. We're, we're spending eight million out of general fund, but that's for right of way maintenance. So when when it comes to fixing pavement. Um, which I think is what most people think of when they say fixing streets, yeah, then that we're using restricted money. So, and that doesn't, that doesn't count towards our maintenance of effort requirement. So, so, so to piggyback on, on that, if, for example, if major uh, 
major X funds were utilized for fixing streets, mm-hmm. you know, pavement, mm-hmm. it would make passing that audit much, much easier because, I mean, you're, right now you're essentially cost allocating um, as opposed to being able to show a direct correlation to the pavement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If we use Measure X money to fix pavement, you're absolutely right. It would make it a lot easier to meet the maintenance of effort requirement. What's the budget for that fund, the restricted fund for the uh, our restricted fund to fix streets? Um, so uh, the the general uh, the, okay. So there's the general fund budget that's just right of way maintenance, and then there's our restricted money budget for fixing streets. That restricted money budget for fixing streets moves up and down each year because sometimes it's grant money, sometimes it's federal monies. Maybe we get a big tranche of federal money like every two to three years. Um, there's different programs. There's state programs. So it, it really fluctuates quite a bit. But we know that we at least get, if we're in compliance, we at least get the $5 million from the county to fix streets. Um, so we know we get that each year. But then each year, federal and state money, it, it varies quite widely. We could get $10 million one year from the feds and nothing for a couple years. So, What was it last year? 18, 19. For Do you know? For particular fund? Uh, I uh, just for it. streets. Like, um, oh, my goodness. It, could this be printed any smaller? Uh, I could take a shot at it. Yeah, why don't yeah. you take a shot at it? Thank you. Since I can't see that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Need my magnifying glass. <laughs> no problem. Um, as as the director of Downs described, our restricted monies in, in in a lot of different places. But just to summarize and or give you a quick synopsis, uh, Measure M2, local fair share from OCT Orange County Transportation Authority, um, prior year 1819 estimated or adopted was 4.8 million in the current or in the upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 1920. Uh, five million dollars um, a new revenue source from the state gas tax so the RMRA it's a new fund it's about two years old um, it was adopted last year 5.5 and it's consistent or will be up anticipated in 1920 as well 5.5 million that gives you a quick synopsis of of two major revenue funding sources outside the general fund which are in our quote-unquote restricted funds and, and we can utilize those, those restricted funds for any transportation type uh, maintenance items, as opposed to a lot of our other um, uh, public works and you know street type funds that are tied to a specific you know corridor project or uh, a specific street project, right? Right. right. They they do come with some spending guidelines. Um, like I don't, I don't. I was. I've been part of LA County for so long, so Orange County is new to me. But um, M two money may be restricted to arterials, yes. not and not residential streets. Okay, that, that is correct. Yeah. yeah. So that would be one case where you couldn't use it to pave like a neighborhood street. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so just like we walked through our Measure um, X aligned spending currently before Measure X, um, this is our new spending. So this basically answers the question of, okay, what new services and programs are you providing with this Measure X revenue? And and this is what we've quantified for you. Um, it's been updated to include the actions of last night. So again, this is an imperfect calculation, but there's a lot of logic to it. I uh, We do the best that we can on this. So recruiting and retaining police officers, that's part of the ballot language. One way that you recruit and retain police officers is that you pay them more money. So that figure there, that $8.4 million, represents the increase to the uh, labor contract the that was negotiated. So salary increases and benefit increases. And that's a way to retain and recruit police officers. Um, the uh, other thing to, to be able to recruit them is that you need people in human resources to conduct recruitments and put them through background checks and all of that good stuff. And so there's uh, we added a dedicated human resources person. There's already several dedicated. We just added another one to improve recruiting. Um, we added two uh, employee compensation for two new 
traffic collision investigators. Um, a lot of uh, 911 response is, you know, related to traffic collision. Well, not a lot, but some. And so these, these folks here would contribute to that. Uh, additional police overtime. If you are paying them overtime to work more hours, um, that in, in cre uh, improves your 911 response time. We have a dedicated team that we have funded in this year's budget that includes a small amount of staffing, primarily it's contractual and the purchase of vehicles for a homeless cleaning team. So it's through the Public Works Agency, it's a truck and equipment and contractors and, and they go out to clean up some of these sites. Um, improvements to park maintenance contracts. Um, that that's literally like you know I, I I can't get too specific with you, uh, but it could be something like you know mow the lawn more frequently or you know trim the trees more frequently, um, park tree replacement, uh, so that you know goes to maintaining the parks as well. Additional park and recreation staffing of close to 1.6 million. Most all of that will be programmed for youth services. That's primarily what those folks do, which is in alignment with the language. Park security contract um, was just approved last night by city council. This would be additional security for the parks, 667,000 a year. Um, this not only improves, uh, ad addresses homelessness, and improves 911 response because you now have security people, eyes and ears in the park. They can, you know, contact PD immediately um, should something happen. Uh, it just improves the, the general uh, safety and, and, like I said, addresses homelessness. Um, three code blue pole cameras at three different parks. And um, that in, improves 911 response as well. And then we added two code enforcement officers funded with the general fund. These would be folks that would be dedicated mostly to homeless issues and cleanup. And then two librarians. And the two librarians would be dedicated primarily to um, youth programs. So that's the best that we could do with quantifying the things that we added to the budget that we think aligns with the Measure X ballot language. Again, this is an imperfect calculation, but it gives you a general idea. In addition to these quantified amounts, we also have unquantified spending. So I have an example here for you. Um, the the 1920 budget also includes additional staff that has been added to perform back office duties in the police department. These are things that police officers are using some of their shift time to do right now because we don't have these people. Once we bring these people in, these police officers will be relieved to spend more of their shift time out in the field. So that also should improve 911 response time but that's very difficult for me to try to quantify for you and put on a reconciliation as to how that plays out. A quick question on that. Are they, are they going to be sworn peace officers? Or are they just going to be clerical type staff? Because again, sworn peace officers are obviously are in a hell of a lot more and are in mm -hmm. a different retirement schedule. Yeah, these are officers. clerical staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. Will they be under the miscellaneous retirement <laughs> budget or the, okay. Yeah, they're, um, they're part of the uh, POA contract but they earn a pension benefit under the miscellaneous contract. Okay. Uh, and the park security, that is a contract company, correct? Yes. Is, is the 16.5 million in addition to the 33 million from last year? Yes. So it's 50 million dollars of aligned spending currently? Yes. To measure X, okay. Yes. So um, here we come to the, the last slide, which is kind of like the next steps for the committee. And please keep in mind, I know that your time is precious, you're volunteering it, but I am happy to stay here with you as long as you would like tonight. At a certain point, I might let my staff go, but <laughs> um, 
to answer your questions if you have them. But here's our next steps. Uh, you do have four regular meetings each year. Um, so the next regular meeting is scheduled for September 11th. It's the second Wednesday of those months. Our sales tax consultant, I've already given them a heads up. They already have it on their calendar. They will be here to make a presentation for you and ask answer your questions and talk about the results of April through June receipts. So um, part, if you read your establishing resolution, you know that part of your your job is to look at what revenue came in and then of course how it was spent which of course is what most people are interested in but you need to know this part too um, and then we expect that after the City Council election for the Ward 4 seat in November 2019 that we will have an your seventh appointee to the committee um, for Ward 4 and then at our December meeting, that's when we expect to have our independent financial statement auditor come and make a presentation to you because uh, part of the Measure X ordinance says that we're going to have an independent audit of Measure X money. And so we're going to have our auditors, White, Nelson, Deal, Evans. Um, it's a CPA firm. They're going to make a presentation to you. And, ta and, and then we will also share with you separately of their presentation the results of our July through September Measure X receipts. And then March 11th, um, that's when you would likely prepare your annual report to the City Council. And this would include any um, of your recommendations for their budget process before they make those budget decisions in April, May, and June, and then the budget's adopted. And, um, and then obviously you'd be receiving the results of their October through December receipts at that meeting. So at this point, I'm happy to answer any question that I possibly can. I'm going to have a few questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think which ones to start with. Um, my my one of my major concerns is um, exactly what you just said in the in the, in the major language with the um, the oversight of uh, f from the in, from White Nelson, and um, I believe that it calls for um, the specific language is sorry just a minute here. I'm going, to, I'm going to get to my concern first and then tell you why. My concern is that this is set up to be um, uh, not achieve the, the desired result uh, on, from the onset, um, primarily because, um, so in 35-215 uh, on the annual audit, it, 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 it has a requirement for an audit of the revenue generated. Okay, easy peasy, all right? Um, but then also the expenditures made, and we've already heard that this is an imprecise guess at this point um, with regards to where major X funds are being expended, and yet there's a requirement for, for an audit of these. Uh, again, the, the revenue side is not going to be an issue, but the expenditure side is going to be um, I would say impossible to form an opinion on. Obviously, they'll be up to White Nelson to be able to decide that, but um, they're going to be looking to you to be able to, um, you know, provide the information to be able to form uh, their to do their test work. Um, are you comfortable that you're going to be able to provide information to them to be able to uh, to issue an unqualified opinion on? On, expend, on the expenditure side? Um, okay, so I'll answer the question a little bit different than how you're expecting. So if we know that Measure X, reve or Measure X revenue is a general fund revenue and is deposited in the general fund and it can be used for any purpose, any legal purpose of the city, and our auditor audits the all expenditures of the general fund and renders a clean opinion for us, an unqualified opinion, um, that our financial statements fairly present the expenditures of the general fund, which is what they're rendering an opinion on. They're, they're basically saying that 
through our audit procedures that their presentation of general fund expenditures is fair. That's basically what the auditor is telling you when they render an opinion. And so they are looking at general fund expenditures in, in total. They will not be able to, to your point, they will not be able to specifically say that these were the dollars that were spent from your Measure X revenue source and that they are presented fairly. And so then I would draw your attention back to the ballot language that includes the um, or any other general right. purpose of the city. And so that's your legal out, if you will, that basically says that if your auditors have rendered an opinion that your general fund expenditures, all of them, are fairly presented, that we have passed a clean audit. And that's exactly what I was assuming you were going to say, mm -hmm. and exactly what I was worried that you were going to, going mm -hmm. to say, because um, essentially this section that's requiring an annual audit, and it was included in the ballot language that there was going to be an annual audit, is there's no incremental audit being done. Correct. Because essentially every city right now is required to have an audit on this, uh, uh, just by the fact that we are a city. That's right. And um, so therefore, by having an additional, uh, uh, the major X revenue in the, the ballot language that comes along with that, of saying that there's, that it's going to be audited, mm -hmm. there's no incremental work being done from the auditors other than coming to a meeting like this, um, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I, I'm just, I'm high, highly concerned mm -hmm. that this, um, that the public and my gut tells me maybe even the folks on this committee were were anticipating be able being able to um, have um, oversight of the funds uh, 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 and n not directing but knowing where they're going and that's not going to be the case either through this committee through your um, very qualified department um, or through the city's independent um, CPA firm. Um, so it's set up to fail expectations from the start. Now, you know, we can point to technicalities, but um, this section is duplicative. Um, and so if it was intended not to have any additional requirements, it should never have even been in the, um, in, in the, in the major to begin with. Um, my sec uh, I'm going to fo follow up with, I know there's not a question there, so I'm not expecting you to respond to it. Thank you. Um, the, the the very next section, which re, um, I think is even more difficult um, to to reconcile. I mean, we're going from one to another. In two to, in two sixteen, it requires an annual expenditure disclosure, um, which uh, you know on an annual basis, a list of expenditures made with sales and use tax monies for the preceding fiscal years. Of which I know that you're going to say, okay, well, it's general fund money, okay? But now, but this is specifically asking for the sales and use tax uh, portion, okay? And, and as you know, and we all just recently heard, um, there, this is it goes into general fund, whether it's property tax, whether it's sales and use tax, whether it's uh, uh, user fees, it's, it's all going into one bucket. And just like you're unable to tell if your property taxes, if my property taxes, if our property taxes are going to pay, you know, your salary or uh, Mr. Vidal's salary or or, or, or maintenance, right. um, you know, uh, across the, across the city on anything, um, there's a requirement here for an annual disclosure of where what is being spent mm -hmm. on these expenditures, which is going to be impossible, in my opinion, yeah. to be able to uh, uh, to be able to achieve. Um, and so I'm 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 concerned for the if if uh, uh, you know obviously you you're going to need need to do something mm -hmm. with this disclosure, but it's going to fall far short of what um, w what I think is required um, because it's impossible to be able to right. uh, to to be able to do. Yeah, and and the best that I'm going to be able to do is this kind of exercise right here where I can say well. You know, this is what I'm looking at. And when we get the actual results, because remember, these are budget numbers. So we will have actual results against these budgeted figures. And so, you know, it, it's unfortunately, 
you've pointed out something absolutely correct. It, it's almost impossible for me to comply with um, what voter expectations would be for the spirit of this language. And, and so something like this is going to be about the best that I'm going to be able and, to do. And, 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 and further, I think um, you're, you're, you're going to have, um, I'm sorry, you were going to. No, what I was going to say is, is that um, I think what committee member Johnson is talking about is we need some metrics. Mm -hmm. For instance, we know what 911 nine response time is now. It's poor. Okay. So are we, or is the public safety department going to put a metric in to track it? I mean, that, that, that would be my first question. I'm, you know, if I look at retaining firefighters and police officers, well, retaining police officers, we, we get retirements every year once they hit 50. Okay. So if we lose 20, we're not retaining those. Did we get more in the backfill? So I mean, so I think that um, in the spirit of Member Johnson's comments is we as as the committee would like, and you take a shot at it or we'll come up with it, certain metrics so that the public, mm -hmm. I understand you're doing this, but in reality, real metrics that mm -hmm. kind of at least say, okay, Chief Valentin gets up and he says, all right, I had 10, 10 retired officers, but I brought in 20 with X amount of dollars. Well, okay, I added. Or 911 response time went from an hour to 45 minutes in this period. And that will be something that not only we could rubber stamp, but also the public at least has a better sense of it. And so either we make those recommendations or we start to tell our various council members who appointed us to say, hey, a little metrics would go a long way to the public saying, I'm okay with you spending the money that way. But it, it, it's gotten, it's, so, so that was my thought, like there are 911 response times. There's a baseline that, this, that they have now. Mm -hmm. Well, is it, we can check in three months or a year if it gets better or not. Mm -hmm. And that would be the recommendation. So that's what I'm saying is, when you look at each category, mm -hmm. come up with it. Ballpark estimate, mm -hmm. or, or not an estimate, but a metric that we could all kind of say, okay, I can live with this, or mm -hmm. let's fine tune it, or yeah. something so that you guys have cover and we are able to say, okay, we think the money was spent somewhat appropriate. Yeah, and that's actually a fantastic idea. Um, I think you're absolutely right that the voters would be very happy. Uh, they they would care less about an accounting yes. dollar for dollar mm -hmm. and more about the fact that their response times went down mm -hmm. for 911. And so I think you're you're yes, spot so, so on. Whatever whatever your whatever the council is requesting obviously is not what finance folks or we would say. Well, did you meet the metric or did you not meet the metric? Mm -hmm. If you didn't meet it, then we got to change it. And, we, and you can change it mid-year, you can change it by quarter, yeah. whatever it is. But I, I think, for at least from where I'm coming from, is a metric for each broad thing, if it's fixing streets like we found out, restricted versus general. Well, okay, let's figure out a way that the general money, mm -hmm. when you're able to point to, okay, we spent general money on X, and then the voters know, and then it's a document, and then... And even for the council members, it's a clean document. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, here you go. We told you what we were going to do, and we did it. Mm -hmm. But right now, I understand what Member John is talking about is we won't know. Yeah. And so we have to figure, maybe we make recommendations, council members make recommendations, staff make, but we figure out a metric so that everybody's comfortable with if there's $60 million, it's spent. And we can point to where it was spent. So and, and this is the, this year is the easiest this is going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, 1920 yeah. is right. the easiest. Because, yeah. You know, think five years down the line when someone is asking, hey, where did Major X money go? Mm -hmm. Where did it get spent on? Okay, right now, we ha we're able to, you know, e yes, it's imprecise and it's an estimate, <coughs> even though I, uh, I, I love that we take estimates down to the dollar. Um, <laughs> it's uh, but, just a formula. <laughs> I, I, but I, I understand, that, hey, I'm a spreadsheet guy. Every, everything, uh, everything is in an Excel uh, for, for me. So, um, you know, so I get that. But this is the easiest year that we have. And it's already imprecise. And, and it, it doesn't need to be perfect. But, you know, every year that we go along, it get, it, the, the, the reporting is going to get diluted mm -hmm. to where it becomes less and less meaningful. Um, and, and this is where, you know, the accounting, the, the, there's a disconnect between the accounting and the results. 
Okay. Absolutely. We can spend money on things because we're required to spend money on things. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to spending money on things that are actually going to provide meaningful results that the community looks at and says, yes, I, I, I can see that. It makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think that the, uh, that the community, uh, the voters voted for was to be able to make a difference, not necessarily just to spend more money. And, that, and that's where I think the metrics you know, which probably maybe goes beyond the scope of this uh, of this right. uh, of this committee, but you know we're also charged with I think giving feedback over this entire process um, is I think ultimately most is maybe is probably more important. And this is coming from a CPA that lives numbers each and every day. That you know the numbers speak volumes to me, but the results on something like this is probably even more important than the, the raw dollars being spent. Because we're not going to be happy with the raw dollars are spent. I can tell you, always this right. yeah. th th this member is not going to be happy with the, where the raw dollars are going to be spent. I can tell you in the world I live in, which is the healthcare hospital world, you can find out any, any month, you can find out what the ambulance offload time is. You can see how long an ambulance sits at a specific hospital. It's public information. So if 911 responses, I would venture to say that the chief knows exactly which neighborhood it takes longest to get to and which one it takes the shortest time to get to. Well, that information needs to be part of this, and those are metrics that can be put in and say, hey, are we meeting it or not? Do you need resources or not? How does this work? Same thing with, if we're going to fix streets, I, I've lived here long enough, as other folks have, we used to fix them by quadrant, neighborhood streets. That's slowed down or stopped. So the question is, how are we going to get back to cycling around? I'm going to do X streets in this neighborhood. Because I think that being transparent will make it easier for us. And it'll make it easier for us, make it easier for you, and make it easier for the council to make whatever decision. So I'm, I'm on board with being a little bit more open and transparent about the process. And if there isn't a metric, if you, there's nothing internally tracked, then maybe we could do that. And you, you have the big pots. You got public works, you got public safety, you got parks and rec. You got the big pots and just say, hey, come up with the metrics so we, so we in finance can track it. Instead of saying I need X, you know, park officers, but wait a second, what's that? Okay, because because what you explained to us, yes, it makes logic, but to actually get up and say, oh, X amount of dollars went, that's not logic. It's just straight numbers. Was well, so. there any way for us as a committee to kind of amend these what's written here? Is there any way that we can suggest on that? Because obviously there's flaws, and I'm glad these two individuals pointed that out. Um, <laughs> But as a committee, can we say, hey, I, I agree with you, the metrics is a wonderful thing, but clearly there's additional flaws that uh, need to be addressed. What, what you can do, so this is a voter-approved ordinance. Mm -hmm. You can't change the ordinance because it's voter-approved. You'd have to go back to, the, back to the ballot to get that done. What you could do is, you know, I, I'm a big fan of just being very very plain language and what you could do is you know make recommendations to the city council write a report whatever that basically says this is what we're charged to do it's nearly impossible to do that because of these reasons this is the closest that we could get to that but we realize it's imperfect we think that what the constituents the voters would appreciate more is this and so we recommend that you do this to demonstrate that the voters are getting something for their money. And so I think that if you were to make recommendations, write a report, do something like that, I, I think that that could go just fine to satisfy the requirements of the ordinance. Because, um, I, 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 you know, like I said, I, I'm a big fan of just, you know, calling a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And just saying this is the best that we could do to satisfy what we think that this expressly states but here's what we think is even more important and, and I mean it, we are charged with expressly stating and reviewing actual expenditures mm -hmm. okay yeah. which again is I mean the, I don't think the intent of this uh, of forming this committee was to be able to review all general fund expenditures mm -hmm. Um, you know, regardless of any uh, technical language, um, and so you know, yeah, I, it's a, it's it's just a, well, it's frustrating to me that one that we have sixty million dollars of aligned new spending and we have sixty million dollars of 
projected revenue. And I'm assuming that you know probably mo most of the folks, uh, actually pro probably everyone around the table, you know, no one no one hoped that we were starting this thing forty you know forty million dollars in the hole, uh, and we have sixteen million dollars in new spending, which means that we have three million dollars of either not spent money or $3 million of existing services, just you know, cost of living adjustments and inflation and, and, and that type of stuff, which a city of our size very easily can, you know, $3 million can be a little bit of a rounding error, um, which is horrible to say, but you know, it's the, the, the truth sometimes. Um, and, and I don't think that, I, I, well, I, one, I'm not positive that um, the public understands that that's where $60 million is going. And so in terms of, uh, you know, if we were having this meeting uh, two months ago and we were able to speak more into the budget, I would have definitely been recommending that um, that we, you know, from a transparency perspective, that we're saying, hey, here's your $60 million. And um, here, here's where, where it went to uh, and aligned with each one of those items uh, listed in the ballot measure. Uh, that you know, on my rough rough numbers, uh, although we got another 1.3 in there, uh, I'll just add it to uh, Parks and Rec. Uh, you know, that we're going from 10.7 million dollars on 911 response, 320,000, I think it's now it's 500,000 of homelessness. Parks and Rec is going to be a four million dollar youth services, 1.6 million dollars, and guess what? 43 million dollars is for is being spent out of the 60 on. Um, uh, actually, we're going to be over that because the 1.7 million of the, uh, the vehicle, um, so it's, it may not even be paying for itself now. But um, 40, 43 million dollars of this is from existing deficit, and and you know, fixing a structural difference. Which yes, it's allowed in the ballot language because that's what the general purpose is. But it's not being that that that's not that's not how it's being. Portrayed through budget discussions that I have seen. Obviously, there's you know discussions that people are reading their their mm -hmm. all the council members are reading their own packet and making their own decisions on things. But uh, from someone that sits on you know the 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 public side, I know my neighbors don't understand that mm -hmm. for sure. Well, that forty million dollars comes out and it, and it may say that in the first paragraph, the council will understand that. Some of the individuals, or maybe the whole the whole committee's not comfortable with what occurred, but we get to write an annual report and they get to accept it, and receive and file it, and if it says it in the first paragraph that we were handed a X amount of deficit, we appreciate finances work to write the deficit, but we think this goes either for or against whatever the voters approve. But we, we want to let the public know that this is what happened because I think. That's really our job is to tell the public this is the money and this is where it went. And right now, you said it correctly, Member Johnson, is that about 43 million or so went to fix a structural deficit that these folks inherited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and and now we're we're even piling on top of yes. it by making your job virtually impossible <laughs> to be able to to do because they're going to ask you to report on expenditures of the sales and use tax money, which is, right. you cannot do. And this is the easiest year that we can do it, and it's still not able to be done. So, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in your spot, <laughs> uh, because it's, I think it's gonna be very difficult. Yeah, and, and unfortunately I've seen in my business that sometimes people um, get very frustrated and they take it out on the messenger. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> they do. I think that if we can inject, I mean, I come from the private sector, most of us do. We've lived and died by metrics and goals, and I think that there's nothing wrong with injecting a few metrics in the process mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to track and figure it out. And if we got a quarterly report on the 911 response, we can definitely send a letter from the commission saying, hey, the ballot measure says this, 911 hasn't improved, why are you going to make any changes? Or just general stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that people have those things to do because we're tasked with sixty million dollars of taxpayer money. It's a lot of money. I mean, if you think about it, it's one, it's twenty percent of the the city budget, right? About. Yeah, and keep in mind that as an oversight committee, um, you you don't have control over resources of no, the city. Sure. 
but but you can make requests that you think might help you do your job and if those requests entail inviting certain people to your next meeting um, to have a more lively discussion about something that's not off the table so just throwing that out okay. would it help you if we made that request to have other departments come in and give you the metrics that we're asking for it might be able to help you to do your job when I hear a, a conversation about metrics all I hear is I'm um, trying to define success and I think like uh, member Leo said and member Johnson said you know from coming from the private sector and dealing with the kind of dollars that we deal with um, <coughs> that is king and the ability to be able to line item out how the measure X dollars are being spent for any given account line I thought would be easy enough to tell you the truth I didn't I wasn't expecting to hear that it's not going to be basically that it's not possible um, it's concerning actually and it's very it's the very reason why I wanted to be a part of this um, committee was to really understand how this measure was built and the legalese behind it and how it's going to be administered so mm -hmm. when it comes down to metrics I I am wholeheartedly um, in favor of kind of defining our success and making sure that we as a group agree on how those metrics and what success looks like yeah I, I think those, those are fabulous ideas and now you can probably understand why I walked you through some of the mm -hmm. background of how the mechanics of this so that you would have a better understanding of it sure. may, may I make a request to the chair that we I think we may have two people that that want to speak that I wouldn't mind hearing before uh, maybe even so that we could maybe possibly respond to them. Could we, could we allow them to be able to speak uh, at this time as opposed to waiting until? Yeah, yeah you can uh, certainly. Uh, until later, I think the chair yeah. would have the ability to be able to. I, I fully agree that. with that, uh, if, that that's permissible right now. Yes, sir. Uh, we had a Madeline Spencer. I know there was a comment there. I know there was a comment there. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was Carter over there. I, I just need you to, I don't know if you're going to have to speak without it, but I need to build that right um, it, they can it, speak and fill it out, right? Yeah, so they, they, they can yeah, speak and fill it out later, so or they can just simply tell you their name. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I have I have personal questions as a resident of Santa Ana, but before that, I wanted to speak um, as a representative of the downtown, which um, I'm one of the. We work for the business improvement district, and I'm here. Um, one of the other folks who also does the same thing couldn't be here and we and I wanted to ask some questions about specifically we had seen that this vehicle incentive program came up and we saw that the essentially that rebate was given for people to purchase vehicles and we thought it was very interesting um, we, I represent 796 businesses in the downtown um, and one of the questions that we had is that we saw in sort of like the agenda that um, I, I learned more tonight because I learned about what the alignments were and why specific things are being paid for, but we didn't see anything or any conversation about how the tax could give something back to the business community. Mm -hmm. At least like 1.5% of the tax we thought should flow back to businesses that are generating the tax. And for example, um, we saw that this vehicle incentive program was given, but um, some of the ideas that we had that we wanted to share were that um, that there's like we noticed that much of the the city is disorganized in terms of there's only one business improvement district and South Main and other places throughout the whole city have no <coughs> no organization and no base base of services to them like for instance street cleaning or um, anything like that and we would like to see more of our city become organized instead of disorganized in this way because we feel that we're able to fight just because we have lead people to come to meetings like this for for our part of the district but other uh, parts of the community don't have that same don't have that ability because they don't have someone like like us but some of the things that we would love to see is like specific area plans um, um, facade improvement programs um, possible use to promote opportunity zones or, or earned increment tax revenue program um, and 
like I just said, the generation of more of the business improvement districts across the whole city. Um, if you go to New York, it has 70. If you go to Long Beach, it has 11 different districts that are there. And then um, also tactical urbanism and placemaking projects which help all these different parts of the city to actually generate more sales tax. And then also our economic development department in the city, which when we're talking about building revenue for a city, we have one person in economic development. I know that there's actually a few more people working with Mark Morley right now, but to be honest with you, a city should never have only one person in economic development when we're talking about the problems of economic development for a city, yet there's absolutely nothing here to help build an economic development department, which is the one who would guide the planning for the city to actually get out of the hole and to be able to move into, into uh, a process of, um, of proper and balanced expenditures and revenue creation. So that's something that I wanted to just put forward from the perspective of what, what we're working with downtown for this committee to look at. But then the other questions that I had that are more personal is, um, there, I wanted to know, and I don't know if it can be answered here because it was something that was mentioned by um, Catherine, um, was you said that there was an eight million projected amount for the cannabis and it didn't come in, in at that. And I was very curious as to know what actually did come in for the cannabis. I know that when they passed that measure, part of that measure went to youth. There was supposed to be a large chunk of that that was supposed to be allocated to youth programming. I would love to know how much of that youth programming allocation is actually occurring and what the actual amounts that came in for that are. Um, Excuse me real quick. We need you to if oh, you'd be so kind to state your name for the record. I'm sorry. My name is Madeline Spencer. Okay. And you've got about... 30 seconds, 30 seconds yes, remaining? Okay. Uh, loud three minutes. So I wanted to know what the allocation for youth is. I wanted to know as a point of clarification when you have on this piece of paper measure X aligned existing spending versus measure aligned new spending, are you talking about that Brad Bradley Burns fund for the first one? Or you're talking about, I didn't understand okay. that. Thank you. Um, and also, I wanted to know when you talked about measure M funding, what happened to the CIP funds that came with the whole transit um, with the whole transit plan, um, is that are those funds like out the window? Because that should be spent being spent on a whole series of things throughout the city, which is an extra cash flow that came in because of the transit being um, put in. Excuse and me, then, sorry, it's, yeah, your time is, is up. Is it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you have a lot there. Can I put in another card? Because I just have one more, a few more questions. There's like two of us here. It's completely at the pleasure of the chair. I, I have no issue with that at all. But I'll let the rest of the, count, the committee would agree. I think you can just let her continue. Yeah, I, if you would, if, you, if, you, if that's okay with you, sir. I'm so sorry. Okay. The, the last you. thing I wanted to ask is when I look at all of these things in the Measure X aligned and in the Measure X aligned new spending, um, I wanted to know, be, prior to even having this Measure X funding, there was a certain amount of the general fund that's already being spent for PD, which at one point it was like about 80%, then it went to like 79%. I also want to know like now if we add to it the Measure X aligned funding, I count like multiple expenditures that are being made to that, and then I see things like youth recreational programs. And if I recall in an economic development council meeting, I heard Gominski name off a whole series of programs that are all run through PD that are youth involved. And you had mentioned that Parks and Recs does it, but most of Parks and Recs' youth recreation programs are paid for by community because people are using it to use the sports in there. They're not doing any external youth programming that allows for kids to come and just use parks because Parks and Rec has teachers for them or something. So I'm really curious where this youth recreation program, if that is actually PD run, because it doesn't say it on here. And then the other, um, the other part of this is the, I am shocked at the amount of money that it's saying that we are spending as a city now for homeless services after 30 years of doing nothing for homelessness. And, um, just because of this Measure X, which this is very shocking, and I'm just wondering if it's being couched in this way 
but actually that those funds are actually unless there's a metric system like everybody here said that this this does not make any sense to me in terms of what it's saying that it's being used for hello uh, commissioners my name is roberto i'm uh, the director of community engagement at resilience orange county we are a nonprofit organization just down the street on 17th um, in Santana, and um, we do we have a lot of youth organizing, youth leadership, youth development uh, at our organization, and then I also focus on specific immigration enforcement that happens across the county. Um, but I just wanted to introduce myself and our organization um, as a public. We are here uh, making sure that uh, everything is transparent and that we're able to communicate out to uh, the Santana public, uh, how these meetings are conducted, and this type of information. Uh, we are obviously concerned uh, about um, where Measure X funding is being allocated. We have been attending uh, city budget meetings um, for the past three years, and so I think we're, we're closely watching how some of this is unfolding, but I uh, appreciate you all sort of investigating a little bit about how this money is being spent and um, trying to be clear. I, I agree with the metrics of what you all are saying um, and the honesty of like telling the truthfulness of the story because I think metrics can be used in a way where you paint it as, you know, this is, yes, we are like doing this, but I think doing it in an authentic way is uh, and transparent would, would, would get community support. So um, I look forward to continuing to attend these meetings and, uh, you know, get more insight into the budget. Yeah, I'm uh, with Resilience Orange County. We have a Facebook, um, Instagram, and uh, website. I, I just want to say thanks for, to both of you for coming out and, and listening through the presentation. It can be, I, I've been in your spot to where you're, you're just waiting for your couple minutes, so I thank you for, for contributing. Um, I really appreciate it. And on, her, on the, the question, do we have, uh, are those youth services through recreation run through the police department or are they through parks and parks and rec? The police does have some recreation programs, but primarily the, the city's youth programs are through the recreation department, or we actually have a different name for it here, but it's in essence the recreation mm -hmm. department. Um, the <clears throat> there, there's a couple things going on here. So um, in answer to one of the questions, how much cannabis revenue do we think that we're going to receive? Um, 10 million or so. Uh, the original estimate for fiscal year 1819 was 15 million. And um, and we think that uh, for 1920, it's actually going to be like 10 million. Um, the city council has, uh, you know, adopted an ordinance that says that we will um, move. <clears throat> we will move um, uh, two thirds of the adult use and uh, which is like retail and commercial cannabis related revenue. So there's medical, there's commercial, which is like the manufacturing, testing, cultivation, distribution, and then there's the um, adult use, which is the, the retail sales. Um, so two-thirds of the commercial and the retail sales is going to go to be um, programmed for youth and enforced one-third, one-third each. Um, the youth figure is, for 1920 is $3.1 million. Um, same with the enforcement piece, so $6.2 million is the two-thirds share um, the uh, uh, the youth the, what they're going to do the plan is with the youth money the 3.1 is that the director who is also new she also joined in October um, she is going to engage the youth commission the city has a youth commission to help formulate a plan and recommendations for spending that 3.1 million so there will be some community input on the programming of that and what that might look like for uh, new services. Um, the public speaker was correct in that uh, recreation programs at parks are 
you know, they there is fees paid to participate in those programs, but um, the those programs are always at every city heavily subsidized. When you look at the cost of providing, you know, a, a recreation sport league or whatever, and what you might charge your residents to participate in that, there's a very big difference. They are always always heavily subsidized programs. Um, so that's a little bit on that. Was there anything else that the chair wanted me to attempt to respond to? Um, nothing comes to my mind. Okay. Yeah. Greatly. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. Getting used to it. Uh, yes. Nothing in particular I can, that I can think of at this time, but uh, there was a lot said, and I appreciate the comment from the public. I think mm -hmm. it's great they're here. I'm glad to see that somebody came. Um, and I really appreciate the comments from the additional members on the committee. I think they're extremely informative. So yeah, nothing that I, if anybody else has any other questions that they'd like to have answered from the present presenters. I don't have any questions, but I do have more of a comment. And I know kind of more touching base on what you said about like the homeless issue, just because everybody touched base on like fixing the streets, um, the parks, the youth and everything. But yeah, definitely like it's, it amazes me to see how much is not really like going into the homeless situation just because I see it increasing and it's 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 a scary thing because I mean well me for example like as a woman walking out at night right now that's a scary thing like are we actually doing something about that and I just want to make sure like how if there would be a metric system to see like what are we doing about that and I see like a line in the previous budget where it says homeless service programs but it's such a small amount like are we going to do something more about that just because it was in the ballot like that was mentioned so i'm just hoping to see that is is there going to be more that we can do about that just because it's it is a big issue that's increasing in santa ana um i know in certain areas it's not as bad but kind of where i live at i know it's 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 getting it's getting pretty bad so hopefully i'm i'm hoping that you know we can see more of that but yeah yeah i'll, I'll piggyback off of uh Remember, Landa Verde said that there seems to be a um, a disparity in the funding. Yeah. I mean, I mean that the number the numbers tell tell the story of a priority, and um, the priority is uh, definitely not on the uh, you know con doing things that are uh, you know addressing homelessness uh, because I mean the, I think we're at five hundred thousand yeah. now, five eighty seven. I mean that's uh, yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be a a, a skew um, on it, but uh, yeah, I would 100% agree. And uh, to to Miss um, to to Miss Spencer's uh, point also with um, one of the other things that she hit upon, which um, you know I'm glad you brought it up because I feel like it's something that we you know this is a committee about ex more on expenditure side, but but she's 100% right. The businesses are. You know, being able to, you know, if we can elevate the sales tax base um, by having, uh, you know, specific districts, uh, business districts, you know, improving facades and, and those types of things, you know, I think that's that's important, and I think it will help, you know, increase the base and and, and have you know to where residents and out and even more importantly, folks from outside the city, because the best dollar, honestly, for the city is a dollar that is earned outside the city but spent here mm -hmm. and and so being able to attract uh the spenders of that money to our city uh, you know and you know things like opportunity zones which i know i've heard council members uh talk about but you know as a cpa then these these opportunity zones are the biggest thing to come out uh on the tax side that we're still figuring out and we have a huge huge opportunity uh, no pun intended to be able to uh, capture um, some tremendous investment from people who have been successful in one venture and they're ready to roll that money into the next venture. Um, so you know, opportunity zones, business specific districts. You know, being able, I mean, it would be phenomenal if we were having this discussion, you know, eight months ago to be able to figure out where we were going to do with this sixty million dollars or twenty million dollars or whatever it was to be able to carve out some money for additional economic development to be able to raise that raise the floor instead of just figuring out you know here's the floor and what are we going to do with it 
because the gr growth in cities come with raising the base. And that, that's where economic development truly comes in, and we're, we're missing it on this. So thank you for bringing that up. To go, go along with the allocation of funds, one of my pet peeves, if you, if you will, is, is the police and fire, the police in particular getting $150.7 million annually. If you talk about things being askew, to me that is, that is um, <laughs> there's something wrong with that picture when, to your point, uh, Tim, that uh, we, you know, we could put it, allocate money to the, to would bring up the base of the city. If you bring up the base of the city, it helps reduce the crime, it reduces the need for the police, and it solves a lot of the social issues that we're struggling with, in addition to solving our budget problems. But uh, even even if you look at the how the money is allocated, even with this additional money, the police still get their two thirds. Um, and to me, that's I, I'm not a I'm not naive enough to believe that we do not need police. I, I, I think that would be naive on anybody's part. But I also believe in the the idea of improving the communities so you can have a reduction in the amount of police. Um, I also don't agree with all the money that they get through their seizure of, of houses and funds goes directly to them. That, to me, that should go into the general fund because they're supported by the general fund. So any additional money they bring in should go back into the general fund. So on, on that line, I, you know, that's just one of my things that I think that we need to really look at. Um, I don't know how much influence we as a committee can have on that. But uh, I think that's definitely something that needs to be looked into um, and given some, I think, some real oversight on where that $150 million goes. So that's my comment on that. And that, again, that dovetails in with if we can put some of that money back into the community, it's better for everybody. I think one of the things um, that we, sh one of the things, because it says unrestricted general fund money, one of the things I think we as residents and businesses struggle with is having to go to the counters all the time. I know we have really good hardware here, but we don't have the appropriate software. There are things we could do online to make it easier for businesses to pay their fees, to get their permits, to not have to come down here and waste two hours. You guys know what we're talking about. And I think over the course of sitting on this committee, maybe one of those recommendations could be bring us to the 21st century. I mean, Anaheim makes it very easy. Costa Mesa makes it very easy. I think it's just software. I don't think it's hardware. So I think those little things go back to what Tim talked about, which was making it easier for the business. Let them pay their fees online. How do we do these things? And you guys come from cities that have done that. It's not – that's not rocket science. I mean, those are things I think that I would recommend – like sales tax. Use the sales tax revenue to – make it easier so business can pay their fees and not and and the people who need a permit don't have to come down here take time out of work because you guys probably get a rush from four to five every day people needing permits how do we make that easier and i'm sure it's not a lot of money it's probably software because i know we have new we have a lot of new hardware so just just those things because i think at the end of the day we're just trying to make it easier for the residents and just something in that space for business would make would help both Right? Oh, it's easier to do business in Santa Ana. I can click and point. I'll open up a shop, right? Or I'll do something. So to me, that's something that going forward, that's kind of something I'll, I'll probably try to dig into more because no one should have to come down and waste half a day trying to get permits and stuff. It's just, it shouldn't be as hard. Anyone else? Comments, questions, suggestions? Well, uh, on what? Okay. On, oh, I'm sorry. Are you able to say anything about the CIP funds? They asked about all of the streets and stuff. You said the five million from M2 is being held, but what happened to capital improvement project funds? There, there are actually a lot of CIP funds. We have $132 million in the current year budget for CIP, but that is a very long discussion. So if you could be a little bit more specific with your question, I can attempt to answer it. Well, didn't those those funds help to comp like I remember a whole like set of things that went to these capital improvements throughout the city with those funding, which is only for the period of I don't know how long the CIP funds last, but I guess my question is 
that was an influx of funding that we did not have before to be able to do a lot of things to help out with street repairs. It's supposed to help businesses. I mean, all different kinds of things. And I know it was allocated to specific projects, but where, like, how does that, how, what does that have to do with what you were saying about the $5 million? Like, what is the overlap between CIP and what is our base? M2 funding of $5 million is just one of many restricted funding sources that we receive that comprise the money that we use to fund our CIP program. So our CIP program in the current year, we have appropriations of um, 132 million. So that includes appropriations from that 5 million of M2, 5 million of RMRA money, um, you know, bits and pieces from the federal government, uh, from the state, grants that have been applied for. It's, it's a whole, there's a long list of, of restricted revenue sources that make up the funding set for that 132 million of projects. And that 132 million of projects includes, um, you know, sewer projects, water line projects, um, some street projects, some park improvement projects, some building improvements. It, it's a whole gambit of, of different, different items. And if I, if I may add to that, I think the thing that we're missing is the money didn't go, disappear. It's still there on the books, it's, it, and it will maintain there until it's spent on those specific restricted projects. And so it, um, it's, it's there, and it will, will continue to be there. So it, it didn't it didn't go anywhere. It's, it, it, it just may not be spent as fast in the community as we'd like to see, but it's still there, as, as my understanding. In essence, you are correct. Um, some restricted monies that we receive are received on a reimbursement basis, meaning that we spend it first and then we basically send a report into the granting agency saying, here's how much we spent, here's the proof for it, now can you send us our check to reimburse us out of the grant that you awarded to us. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I would also like to, to point out that um, since this is all general fund money in major, uh, that is major X, so I don't personally, even though I know that we want to be focused on you know this the, like the slide that we see up here on new spending and, but at the end of the day, it's all commingled and so I don't think that there should be anything off the table like uh, Mr. Leo had brought up some other points and and we, we all kind of brought up some points that are outside of this, you know it is. Um, you know these types of items that maybe originally walking in going that might we might have been thinking was out of scope but because on one hand it is all general fund money mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I personally don't think that there should necessarily be things that are you know that we think are totally off limits I mean obviously we're a, uh, you know a, a, gui a, a guidance type committee and there's no true power um, at all but you know I, I don't I, I think uh, we have some some, some smart folks here and we should feel free to uh, you know be able to explore some of those types of options I would and in conclusion I'd like to really uh, thank uh, uh, Catherine you, you and your staff for, uh, for for this uh, you know for this information tonight and I think I'm done with any of my my questions so I just want to give my thanks uh, to, 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 to you guys and and, and uh, being available to answer our, our questions and stuff I, I know that the, you guys love this stuff every day um, so it's obvious to you guys but it's not obvious to to other folks so thank you very much okay at, at pleasure of the chair um, it appears that our next items on the agenda before adjournment are staff member comments and committee member comments um, personally I think you've heard enough from me for staff member comments tonight um, did Sergio did you want to add anything I have no comments thank you for attending okay so I think uh, and uh, our last item is committee member comments before adjournment, um, but you may have covered that as well. So it's at the pleasure of the chair. <laughs> uh, I have no comments. Any, any other members? Uh, my, only, my final comment would be thank you for everybody for coming. Uh, it's been great. You've got a lot of information. I've got some great people here. And uh, yeah, let's hope it all works out for everybody. And Would you like to adjourn I'm, the meeting? I was just going to say, if you'd like to adjourn, <laughs> let's adjourn. So moved. All right.
Thank you.